Hello, modern Europe, and welcome to the fifth lecture podcast. We're now in unit five. In this unit, we're going to be looking at what Europe was like after the French Revolution. Certainly, conservative authorities across Europe tried their best to roll back the changes that the French Revolution had brought about. But really, as they would find out, it was too late to put the genie back into the bottle. The first half of the 19th century was marked by constant calls for reform, often met with violence. All of this culminates in a, a sweep of revolutions across the continent, the revolutions of 1848, which really would lay the groundwork for the more substantive changes which would take place in the second half of the 19th century. I'll also introduce you to new philosophical mo movements in this lecture, such as uh, socialism and romanticism and uh, liberalism and conservatism. So we've got lots of stuff to cover, so let's just jump right in. The learning objectives for Unit 5 are, number one, describe post-revolution conservatism and the aims of the Congress of Vienna. Number two, Compare 19th century ideological movements such as liberalism, nationalism, socialism, and romanticism. Number three, describe some of the political reforms of the early 19th century. And finally, number four, discuss the different stages of the revolutions of 1848. So when the French Revolution uh, finally came to an end with the defeat of Napoleon in 1814, uh, the victorious countries had reason to celebrate. The French Revolution had dragged on for over 20 years, and during it, it had upended the social order in France. And due to Napoleon's um, successful military campaigns across Europe, Napoleon's armies had essentially exported many of the dangerous ideas of the revolution across Europe, ideas such as equality under the law and nationalism. Uh, what you see here is an image of poor Napoleon uh, walking out to his exile on the island of Elba. Um, as you may recall, it didn't last. Napoleon managed to escape and briefly had a 100-day romp around um, before he was defeated one last time in 1815 and this time sent to St. Helena. But for all intents and purposes, let's just say from 1814 onward, things had pretty much ended with respect to the French Revolution. However, the ideas of the French Revolution were contagious. Nevertheless, the conservative rulers of countries such as uh, Austria and Prussia and, um, and Russia and Britain, well, they were going to give it a good college try to see if they couldn't roll back the clock and make things the way they were before. So when the victorious countries, Austria, Britain, Russia, Prussia, sat down at the bargaining table uh, at the Congress of Vienna, their number one goal was to roll back the changes of the French Revolution and to make sure that never, ever happened again. They were operating under the principles of legitimacy and compensation. Legitimacy being the idea that the people who should be ruling countries are the people who have always been ruling countries. That is the landed hereditary elite. And compensation being the idea that we should restore the borders of the different countries of Europe to their former status prior to the uh, French Revolution and Napoleon's uh, armies marching everywhere. Uh, so in some cases, this meant that there was some land that shifted around all in the interest of maintaining a balance of power of Europe. So the borders of France were roughly restored. Um, the Papal States were restored to the Pope. Um, sometimes land did shift, though. For example, um, although the right to to the uh, uh, to territory in the Netherlands, which Austria controlled, was granted to Austria. Austria ended up trading it to Holland, and in return, um, uh, Austria received uh, Lombardy and Venetia in Italy. So there was a little bit of of horse trading as well. But the whole idea basically was to make sure that all the powers of Europe are satisfied. That things are as much as possible back to the way they were before. There were also some very obvious changes. So France clearly was not going to be allowed to continue on as a republic, but instead uh, it would be restored to having a king on the throne, to a monarchy. And luckily, Louis XVI's brother uh, happened to have survived the French Revolution and 
strangely enough, he was also named Louis. And so Louis was invited um, to uh, take his... Uh, the empty throne that his brother had vacated when his head had been chopped off by the guillotine in the French Revolution, and thus to restore France to having a monarchy. Um, however, there uh, was some consideration to the fact that um, we couldn't really go back to having an absolutist ruler again in France, or pretty much anywhere for that matter. That ship had sailed. Absolutism just wasn't going to fly anymore. So instead, France was restored to a constitutional monarchy. A constitutional monarchy is a monarchy where the king is constrained by law to a degree. They can't just do anything that they want and that there is a balance of power shared between the king and an elected uh, body like a parliament. So this was the type of monarchy that existed in Britain, um, a constitutional monarchy, and it would be what uh, would exist now in France. Now, you may be wondering, why did um, Louis XVI's brother take on the title Louis XVIII when he became king? Well, there's a story to that. So, uh, Louis XVI had actually had a son, uh, and the son had um, spent most of the revolution in prison, and he sadly, as a little boy, died in prison. Now, his uncle, um, out of respect for his dead nephew, uh, wanted to take on the title of Louis XVIII because his nephew, who was also called Louis. I mean, they, they just didn't have any other names for boys in this family, I guess. Uh, Louis um, would have been Louis the 17th had he lived and had he become king after his dad. Uh, so out of respect for his dead nephew, uh, his uncle took the title of Louis the 18th. So what else happened with the Congress of Vienna? So they created a loose confederacy of German speaking states in the center part of Europe. Now, if you had taken the first half of this course, um, uh, the early modern uh, half of this course, you would know that for much of the Middle Ages, this area of Europe was part of a loose confederacy that was known as the Holy Roman Empire, um, just for confusing reasons it's called that because it has nothing to do with Rome and it wasn't particularly holy. Nevertheless, it, that's what it was called. And Napoleon had put an end to the Holy Roman Empire with his armies. Um, so this loose uh, German Confederacy essentially was created to replace it. Now, within the German Confederacy, each of the uh, little states pretty much were had sovereign rights. So it was really more of a trading block than anything else. And uh, almost immediately, it was um, beset by bickering because uh, two of the members of the uh, German Confederacy were, of course, Prussia and Austria, who were essentially rivals with one another. So don't think of the German Confederacy as a country. It definitely was not that. Finally, there was an effort um, with the rulers at the Congress of Vienna to find a way to prevent future con uh, conflicts from happening in the first place. And so the new idea was to be called the Concert of Europe. The idea was that any of the powers of Europe, if they felt that there was a conflict brewing or they had some squabble with another country of Europe, could call a Congress. And everybody would send representatives to the Congress and they would sort things out. In my mind, I imagine these Congresses as, you know, older white men sitting around uh, smoking cigars in, you know, the parlor discussing world affairs over brandy. That's the way I've always imagined the Concert of Europe. And certainly it was intended as a way to prevent future conflicts. Of course, it wouldn't last, but we'll see that later. So here you can see a map of Europe after the Congress of Vienna. Uh, I want to just draw your attention to a few things. So notice, first of all, that there is no country of Germany yet. Uh, there is that loose uh, trading alliance, which is the German Confederation, which I just was speaking about. Um, but there's no Germany. There's no country called Germany yet. That is in the future. Um, there's also no country of Italy. Italy uh, was never really united throughout the Middle Ages, the early modern period period and most of the modern period. It was uh, lots of little independent states, uh, little uh, city states like Venetia um, or the Papal States, which were centered on Rome and controlled by the Pope, but it was never unified as a country. It hadn't really been unified since the Roman Empire, really. 
Um, the other thing I just want to draw your attention to is uh, within that German Confederation, you had um, it was all German speaking states, but it also included the Austrian Empire. And the Austrian Empire was a pretty big empire that included many different ethnicities and many different languages. And one of the things that the uh, members of the Congress of Vienna wanted to stamp out was nationalism, because nationalism was a direct threat to empires like the Austrian Empire because nationalism might inspire various component parts of the Austrian Empire to want to break away and form their own country. So this is what Europe looked like at the beginning of the 19th century after the fall of Napoleon. But of course, we will see dramatic changes over the next uh, 75 years um, as the balance of power is completely changed and we see the emergence of Germany and Italy. But that will have to wait until the next lecture. So by the time we get to the 1800s, Europe is really a fundamentally different place. The French Revolution and the Industrial Revolution have transformed life everywhere. And what we see by the 1830s is a real sort of difference of opinion about the correct direction for Europe to go in the future. We see competing ideologies, and these competing ideologies will really define a lot of the strife that we see in the 1800s, particularly the revolutions of 1848, which we'll be discussing later on, which sweep across just about every major country and capital of Europe. The first two ideologies I'll be discussing are really a nostalgia for the past. They are romanticism, and conservatism. Both of these ideologies harken back to the time before the French Revolution, before the Industrial Revolution, and nostalgia for that time. The next three ideologies that I'll be talking about are really a consequence of all these big changes. So the French Revolution brought us the concept of nationalism. The Enlightenment brought us the idea of liberalism. And socialism is really a direct result and answer to the Industrial Revolution and the uh, living conditions that it had brought on. So I'm going to talk briefly about each of these different ideologies, uh, and then we'll move into the revolutions of 1848. Romanticism is, first of all, an artistic and literary and intellectual movement. Um, often it's associated with paintings like the one that you see here by Caspar David Frederick. Uh, the wanderer above the sea of the fog. It generally has a, a glorification of the past and nature. It tends to prefer the medieval rather than the classical period. It harkens back to that time prior to the uh, Fr French Revolution, a, a time when there were nobles, a time when tradition and um, uh, one's place in society mattered. There tends to be in Romanticism in the artistic and literary works an emphasis on emotion and on the individual. Ultimately, Romanticism is a reaction to the ideas of both the Industrial Revolution and the aristocratic social and political norms of the Age of Enlightenment, the scientific rationalization of nature that comes out of that as well. So similar to Romanticism in that it is a nostalgia for the past is conservatism, which is the next ideology I'm going to talk about. Now, when we say conservatives in the 19th century, uh, it's very, very different from conservatives the, you know, when we're talking about politics in uh, the 21st century. Although the words are the same, they're very, very different. And this also is true for um, uh, liberalism, which we'll be talking about in a moment. Um, conservatives and liberals in the 21st century don't really bear much resemblance to conservatives and liberals in the 19th century. So what was conservatism in the 19th century? Well, it was a political doctrine that emphasized the value of traditional institutions and practices, and it was a reaction to the upheavals of the French Revolution. This is a movement that harkened back to a time prior to the French Revolution, in particular the way power was distributed prior to the French Revolution. Conservatism in the 19th century believed that the essential anchors of social harmony were number one, monarchy, aristocracy, and the church. That these three elements are the pillars of having a good society. Often um, conservatism in the 19th century is, is associated with this man here, uh, Clemens von uh, Metternich, and he was an Austrian diplomat who was you know, involved in massive amounts of politics during the um, uh, first half of the 19th century. 
And in particular, he was involved in this concept of the concert of Europe, which we talked about. This is this, um, I described it kind of like uh, white men sitting around in a parlor with cigars and brandy, sorting out uh, the problems of Europe, rather than involving, you know, the messiness of regular people. This is a group that believes that the old ways are best and that all the new ideas that came out of the Enlightenment are terrible for society. So one of the things that conservatives really hate in the 19th century is nationalism. And now nationalism is something that has been a powerful movement that came out directly of the French Revolution. We talked about it a little bit in the uh, last uh, podcast. Um, we talked about it transformed the people of France from subjects, meaning subject under the king, to citizens of France. That when people were fighting in the wars during the French Revolution, they were fighting as citizens. They were doing their duty to France, not their duty as subjects to the king. And that is a really big difference. Now, although we use the term nationalism today, it is somewhat of a nebulous term and it means different things to different people. So what do we mean by nation? Think about that for a second. What constitutes a nation? Well, there's various conceptions of it. Uh, we could think of a nation as being a group of people that are bound by a particular language. So even in Canada, for instance, often uh, Quebec is described as a nation. Um, we could talk about a people being bound by a particular culture. So a group of people who share the same culture might consider themselves being members of the same nation. So if we talk about the first nations in Canada, they would have both language and culture. We can also talk about a shared history. Perhaps a shared history to some degree or another is what uh, constitutes the nation of Canada in that we share a collective history that we that our ancestors or the or those who were here before us uh, went through in the forging of Canada. Uh, other conceptions of nationhood might also include ethnicity. So groups of people of uh, the same ethnicity might consider themselves a part of the same nationhood. And of course, there's also geography. We could apply geography as a, another measure of nationhood. Perhaps uh, geography is another measure of Canadian nationhood. The point is, is that different people um, consider nationhood in different ways. And there is no one way uh, to think about nationhood. And that's as much true today as it was during the 19th century. It's this concept of nationhood which is really um, the most important thing. It's born out of a desire of a community, without sort of defining what that community is, to assert its unity and its independence. So whether that community is bound by language or culture, shared history, ethnicity, or geography, I mean, in many ways, it's the community that would define that relationship themselves. It is this desire for independence from some larger group. And that's what makes nationalism so dangerous to these large empires. It threatened large empires like the Austrian Empire and the Ottoman Empire. And for conservatives who wanted to see the status quo maintained, particularly people like uh, Metternich, who was uh, from Austria, who was a diplomat from Austria, uh, nationalism was a direct threat to him. It was a direct threat to the integrity of the Austrian Empire. And sort of spoiler alert, Nationalism wouldn't go away. It ultimately would destroy these large empires. By the time we get to the 20th century, the Austrian Empire will be it will be destroyed during World War One. The Ottoman Empire will be destroyed, and all these different groups will uh, the, will break apart and form their own countries. We'll also see disparate groups come together. For instance, the Italian. Um, uh, peninsula will uh, unite during the late 1800s and become the country of Italy and German speaking nations in uh, Central Europe will unite together and form uh, the country of Germany late in the 19th century too and these uh, new nations would have a profound um, influence on the balance of power in Europe and, and ultimately these would lead to the world wars of the 20th century. So nationhood is not necessarily always a good thing um, because nationhood often um, uh, pits one group of people against another uh, in, in violence. So the next 19th century ideology I want to talk about is liberalism. Now, just like conservatism during the 19th century, li liberalism is not the same thing that exists today in the 21st century, although the word is exactly the same. So if you were to say someone was a liberal today in the 21st century, you might mean that they were 
um, a supporter or a part of the um, Liberal Party of Canada, or perhaps they are a small L liberal, which means that they would define themselves as on the left of the political spectrum. That is not at all how liberalism was defined in the 19th century. So just like conservatism was different in the 19th century, liberalism was different as well. So the words are the same, but the movements are completely different. So really liberalism in the 19th century, first of all, is associated with capitalism and with the rise of factories coming out of the Industrial Revolution. And in many ways, the philosophy emerged as a response to the Industrial Revolution and the urbanization of the 19th century. But really, the roots of liberalism go further back in time than that. In many ways, liberalism finds its uh, roots in Enlightenment thinkers such as John Locke. And to me, at least, liberalism is directly associated with the rise of the middle class. And we have been talking about the rise of the middle class in this course for quite some time. We talked about um, in the going way back in time uh, to the 12th century, where we saw the rebirth of cities and the rise of town people and merchants. Uh, often called the bourgeoisie, uh, that they were the you know prototype for the middle class. And in fact, um, Karl Marx in his Communist Manifesto will rail against the bourgeoisie um, when he's reacting against liberalism uh, with um, communism and socialism. So liberalism, you could think of it as to some degree a rise of the middle class, but it is the rise of the wealthiest of the middle class because liberalism often is associated with the factory owners rather than the workers who actually work in the factories. So generally speaking, though, liberalism, if we're thinking about it from its enlightenment roots, uh, from people like John Locke, is really about the idea that people are free. So it advocated for civil, uh, civil liberties, which means that, you know, everyone should be able to uh, conduct their business as they see fit without the government coming in and telling them what to do. So it believed in a limited government and it believed that there should be a rule of law that, you know, protected everyone. Liberalism is absolutely associated with the concept of private property. So what you are able to earn and, and get for yourself, then you should be entitled to keep. And it also believed very strongly in the concept of laissez-faire economics. And this is a type of economics that was first talked about during the Enlightenment with Adam Smith, an economist who believed that the best way for um, um, for nations and individuals to succeed is for there to be as little regulation as possible, as little government intervention as possible, that businesses will flourish under such circumstances, that there'll be more jobs and more capital for everyone. And certainly liberalism in the 19th century absolutely believed that. However, the dark side, of course, of liberalism is that unrestrained capitalism meant that people who were working in factories faced uh, pretty horrible conditions in the 19th century. And that's what we'll talk about next. So the Industrial Revolution obviously brought with it tons of social change, it brought with it urbanization, and it brought with it um, a change of what people did. People moved from the countryside and moved into cities and, and ultimately worked in factories. Factories in the 19th century, though, could be very dangerous places. Um, child labor, for example, was very common. There were no laws whatsoever at all, very, very, very few labor laws whatsoever. Um, so you, uh, if you were a worker in a factory, you might be asked to work seven days a week, um, very long days, 18 hours a day. If you got injured, then you simply lost your job. There was no protection for you. The factories themselves could be very, very unsafe. The new machines were not designed with the idea of safety in mind. Um, and so going to work could be a very risky scenario. On top of that, wages, um, for the most part, were um, kept very, very low. Um, during the early part of the Industrial Revolution, um, factory owners were able to coordinate with one another to make sure that wages were suppressed as low as possible. So it's in this environment that we see the final ideology that I'm going to talk about, which is socialism emerge. So socialism is also a direct result of the Industrial Revolution, although whereas liberalism was more concerned with the owners of capital or the factory owners, socialism was concerned with improving workers' rights and workers' lives. So it's, it's really a result to a certain degree of the conditions of the Industrial Revolution for people who worked in it. It also brings with it a very clear class consciousness. So socialism um, very much is about uniting um, the working class, or at least giving the working class agency to make changes. 
um, the socialism during the 19th century will ultimately lead to massive changes. It will lead to things like labor unions or trade unions, which are organized groups of workers getting together, banding together to demand improved conditions, improved laws, improved pay. Um, and all of this will ultimately result in um, um, a great improvement of the conditions um, of, of working uh, people's lives during the 19th century. It will also affect things going on at the state level. So state socialism will bring about it the beginnings of the modern welfare state, the beginnings of a social safety net, things that just about every single Western country today uh, enjoys, um, whether in Canada we think of things like Medicare or, or welfare itself or unemployment insurance. All those are concepts that were first talked about during the 19th century under socialism. Now, there are many, many different types of socialism. So um, the movement itself was very splintered during the 19th century. Um, it's most often associated with one particular splinter, which is um, uh, communism, which was a, 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 an offshoot of socialism proposed by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, um, who published uh, their famous pamphlet, The Communist Manifesto, in 1848. The two of them had become uh, friends. Um, uh, living in, in London, England, uh, Frederick Engels had um, uh, written um, a treatise about the conditions of workers um, in factories in Manchester, England. And um, from that, uh, the two of them had um, developed together this idea of communism, which called for essentially a working class revolution. Um, they called the working class the proletarians. And the idea was that they would uh, ultimately uh, gain control over the means of production. So rather than there being factory owners that own things, the ownership of production would be shared by all the workers. And under communism, they called for the abolishment of private property um, uh, so that it would be shared amongst all. But this was just one of the many offshoots of socialism. Socialism in a more general sense um, it was a, a re-emphasis on labor rights, a re-emphasis on worker conditions, and would have a profound effect on uh, reform during the 19th century. So another way to look at these different ideologies is how they competed with one another and how in many aspects they represented the opposite of the other ideology. So for instance, romanticism, which was a reaction against the rationalism and science uh, that came out of the enlightenment and the scientific revolution uh, and conservatism, which is very similar to it, um, which is essentially an ideology, which is <laughs> sometimes is summed up as rule and change nothing. That after the French revolution, they just wanted to roll back the clock and that rulers would rule and they would leave things alone. None of this reform business. And so at the opposite end of conservatism and romanticism is nationalism. The idea that no, we, we hold our loyalty not to some person who is a king or not to someone who is born into a position as an aristocrat, but rather that we uh, have a, um, that national feeling defines our identity and commands our ultimate political loyalty. Similarly, liberalism and socialism stand opposite to one another. So liberalism uh, is a belief in economic freedom and limited government. But the flip side of liberalism, though, also means that those uh, who are haves um, can oppress those who are have nots. And under unrestrained capitalism, we have we see what um, happened in um, in the factories of the early 19th century and the extreme conditions that existed there. Whereas socialism supported the concept of social ownership of property rather than private ownership. So all of these ideologies really are in contrast for one another. Um, what is interesting though, if we take conservatism and romanticism out of the category, socialism, nationalism, and liberalism, although they're very different in, and they have different aims, all share one common goal that they want to see change. Conservatism and romanticism wants to see things remain the way they are. And this is really what will happen once we get to the revolutions beginning around 1830 and culminating in 1848 across Europe, where we will see nationalists, liberals and socialists actually band together because to a degree they share a common goal to see change. But then once that change has started to affect, well, that's where they'll start to fall apart and disagree because they have very different end goals in mind.
So I want to turn to France first, because it's in France where we start to see the first rumblings again uh, of revolution. Um, the big French Revolution may be over, but that does not mean that uh, things are all well. So we met in the last podcast uh, the brother of Louis the Sixteenth, uh, Louis the Eighteenth, uh, who you see there on the left. This was um, Louis the Sixteenth's brother, and he, along with his younger brother Charles, who you see in the middle there, had managed to escape during the French Revolution, and so they didn't get their heads chopped off like their older brother did. Um, and remember, uh, Louis, when he was offered the throne after uh, the French Revolution, after the defeat of Napoleon, he took on the um, title of Louis the 18th out of respect for the fact that his uh, older brother had had a son uh, who had also died during the French Revolution. He died in captivity. But had he lived and had he become king, then he rightfully would have been Louis the 17th. And so his uncle um, decided to be Louis the 18th out of respect. Uh, so Louis the 18th um, uh, was a, a restoration of the Bourbon monarchy following um, the defeat of Napoleon. Um, Louis, unfortunately for him, uh, died in 1824 and he died without having an heir. And so his younger brother, this is now another brother of Louis XVI, um, Charles X. Charles um, was not a very popular king. Um, and it, by 1830, and I'll explain in various reasons why this happened, by 1830 he was forced to abdicate. Um, and he had to, you know, um, uh, cut tail and, and run out of France. And uh, his uh, cousin, Louis Philippe, um, uh, would um, ascend to the throne. And so we'll talk about what actually caused Charles to uh, have to give up the throne. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about what actually happened in France then. But generally speaking, we're going to be talking about between 1830 and 1848, how there were rumblings all across Europe, really, which culminated in 1848. Uh, so in France, when um, the French Revolution finished and Napoleon was defeated and uh, Louis XVIII was given the opportunity to reascend to the throne and restore the Bourbon monarchy, he had to agree to something first. Remember, they weren't going to go back to having an absolutist monarchy. Um, everyone knew that that just wasn't going to be tenable after the French Revolution. And so the compromise was that they would go to a constitutional monarchy similar to what they had in England and Britain. Um, and that was the French Charter of 1814. Uh, this essentially is what made France a constitutional monarchy. And in fact, the Congress of Vienna wouldn't allow Louis XVIII to ascend to the throne unless he agreed to this French charter of 1814. And so Louis agreed to it. Um, and then fast forward a bit, Louis dies and his younger brother, Charles, takes over. And Charles, as I said, wasn't very popular. He did a bunch of things that people didn't like, including um, he passed laws saying that it, uh, you could be uh, put to death for blaspheming um, the, uh, um, uh, the Eucharist in the Catholic Church. The Eucharist is the bread uh, that becomes the body of Jesus, according to uh, Catholics during the Mass. And if you said something wrong about that, well, you could be put to death. Um, so that was one thing. Another thing that people didn't like about uh, Charles was that he wanted to see there be financial compensation for nobles who had lost their property during the French Revolution. And nobody thought that was very good at all. Uh, so all of this results um, with, you know, a general sort of discontent. But the straw that broke the camel's back was when uh, Charles tried to revoke the French Charter of 1814, essentially undoing the fact that France had become a constitutional monarchy. This leads to the Revolution of 1830, and he's forced to abdicate, and instead his cousin, Louis-Philippe, becomes king. Uh, Louis-Philippe, um, uh, also didn't really have a great time being king, um, but he had a little bit of the bad luck that um, uh, very shortly after the revolution of 1830, uh, there were some bad harvests, there was a cholera epidemic, people were starving, and, there, and people were um, uh, getting really sick and dying in the streets, and this led to a series of uprisings in 1832. 
um, which it ultimately would be brutally put down um, by Louis Philippe, which would not endear him to the people. Incidentally, this is where um, the story Les Miserables by Victor Hugo, that was later turned into a musical that maybe you have seen, um, this is where it's set, is during these um, uh, June uprisings in Paris in 1832. So uh, if you know that, uh, you know, do you hear the people sing, singing the songs of angry men? Da, da, da. I'm not going to sing it because um, I'm not very good at it. But anyway, you get my uh, drift. So Britain was another place in which uh, there was a quest for reform in the years following the French Revolution. Um, in Britain, although there was a parliament and it was a constitutional monarchy, uh, there was not um, equal representation in that parliament. First of all, very few people were actually allowed to vote in Britain. Only men of a certain class could vote. Only men that owned a certain level of property could vote. So women couldn't vote. And most men, frankly, couldn't vote either. And so there was certainly a push for uh, male suffrage, for what they call universal male suffrage. Suffrage is a word that means the right to vote. And in the early 19th century, the quest is for male suffrage, for all men to be able to vote. And we will see once men achieve the vote, which by the middle of the 19th century, middle to the late 19th century, um, in most European countries, um, just about all men have won the right to vote. But women, no. And so the quest for women's suffrage will continue into the 20th century and will be achieved in places like Canada um, after World War I. Um, but we're still 100 years or so before uh, women will get suffrage, and, and at this point, men don't even have suffrage either. So only wealthy men essentially are allowed to vote. The next problem is, is that there's inequality of representation in Parliament. So um, where people lived in England had changed dramatically since the Industrial Revolution. Places like Manchester, which had been quite small, um, uh, prior to the Industrial Revolution, it sw had swelled by thousands and thousands of people as, as people had moved from the countryside to work in factories. Um, and yet, they still had very few representatives in Parliament to represent all these thousands of people. And yet, at the same time, the divisions of where sort of the ridings were, or the boroughs as they were called in England, um, were divided up hundreds of years earlier. And in some cases, some of those boroughs had nobody living in them anymore, and yet they still had a member of parliament. They were called rotten boroughs. Uh, one example is a, of a rotten borough was a place called Sarum, outside of Salisbury in England. And it had been um, an important place uh, during the Middle Ages. But by the time we get to the 19th century, Almost nobody lived there. Something like 15 or 20 people lived there. And yet they still had a member of parliament. So that member of parliament only had just a few constituents to worry about. And yet places like Manchester with thousands and thousands of people would have um, the same level of representation, which obviously was completely unfair. Um, this, all of these you know, issues resulted in a massive demonstration in Manchester um, uh, on uh, St. Peter's Field. And sadly, um, the authorities sent in the uh, cavalry to break it up, and that's what you're seeing here, it became known as the Peterloo Massacre in August of 1819. Um, and this was um, a, a major sort of setback for reform in Britain. But for the most part in Britain, we see a pattern where reformers were relatively successful compared to other European countries, and in particular compared to France. And it might be one of the reasons why when we get to the big revolutions of 1848, Britain will be one of the few countries in in Europe, which will not experience the revolutions of 1848. Um, so, um, for example, by 1832, uh, Britain had passed the Great Reform Bill, and this bill did away with rotten boroughs. It did away with this unequal representation. Now, it still didn't grant universal male suffrage, so it's still um, most men couldn't vote, but it was definitely a step in the right direction. Um, the very next year, we saw the abolition of slavery across the British Empire, again because of a major abolition movement within uh, Britain. And even in Canada, we saw rebellions in 1837 in Lower Canada and Upper Canada, essentially um, about the same type of, of ideas. In Canada, it was about uh, responsible government, the idea that um, people living in Canada uh, would be able to have a say in how their governments were run. Um, and in 1846, we saw the um, uh, another movement which helped the poor, which was the abolition of corn laws. Um, corn laws had been these laws that essentially wealthy 
um, agricultural landowners had put into place, uh, which uh, prohibited um, uh, the importation of foreign um, grains and foreign agricultural products. And this essentially pushed the price of corn and bread and other food items very, very high in Britain. And of course, the people who suffered most under that situation were poor people. But by 1846, those laws had been repealed, and now uh, the price of grain could actually um, uh, go down. And so in, in Britain, there was a certain amount of success, a, a general momentum of reform. This was an anomaly, though, really. In the rest of Europe, uh, we saw the opposite. We saw what happened in France, where uprisings were brutally put down. And this is why, um, once we get to 1848, we see an incredible burst of violence spread across Europe. So the revolutions of 1848 began in Paris in February of 1848. Uh, but very quickly, the uprising spread to Austria, to Germany, to Italy, and beyond. The revolutions of 1848 were a series of political upheavals that were felt throughout Europe, and they remain the most widespread revolutionary um, moment in European history. The revolutions were essentially um, uh, a, a, a truce of sorts between different competing groups that all sought to see change happen. So you saw liberals um, pairing with nationalists and pairing with socialists. All of these groups essentially wanted the same thing, to change the status quo. Um, and so this gave the, the movement of these uh, rebellions uh, quite a bit of momentum, at least in the initial period. And as we'll see, the rebellions were, at least in the beginning, incredibly successful. So the revolutions of 1848, why did they actually happen? Well, probably the biggest reason was economics. So by the time we get to 1848, we've seen this gradual disappearance of artisan production. So what are artisans? Artisans are uh, people who are very skilled at creating different types of products. It's how all manufactured products used to be prior to the Industrial Revolution. So uh, you would have weavers who would spend their entire lives becoming really, really good at weaving, and they would be producing cloth. Um, however, during the Industrial Revolution, machines would replace that, and people essentially with very little skill would operate those machines. And so the end of artisan production saw many, many people displaced in terms of their economic livelihood. On top of that, we saw an economic depression in the years just uh, prior to 1848. So between 1845 and 1846, there was a depression that went across Europe. Coupled with the economic issues were the fact that buildings since the Industrial Revolution and the French Revolution were these new political movements. So we had liberalism, socialism, and nationalism all competing and all pushing for changing the status quo. So here you see on, on your map just how many places in Europe experienced uh, major uprisings or rebellions between 1848 and 1849. In no other year had this many revolts broken out simultaneously. And in many cases, the revolutions led to uh, reforms and, in fact, new constitutions. On the whole, most of the uprisings of 1848 were successful initially. So in the first stage of the revolutions of 1848, the revolutionaries won significant changes. For example, in France, we saw um, the Second Republic uh, be uh, initiated. So the First Republic being uh, the one that came into play during the French Revolution. So the Second Republic um, saw the monarchy again um, uh, dismantled. And to deal with the massive unemployment across France, uh, the government created national workshops. These were places where unemployed men could go uh, for uh, work, and they would be guaranteed work, and they'd be guaranteed food. Um, in Austria, we saw the, uh, the Empire of Austria adopt a very liberal constitution, and we saw the abolition of medieval serfdom, one of the last places uh, that still had remnants of the Middle Ages in terms of the legal status of serfdom. And in Prussia and other German states, we also saw reforms as well, too. So the second stage of the revolutions of 1848 saw all these changes essentially rolled back. And largely this was because of divisions within the rebel ranks. Once they had achieved success, the revolutionaries 
couldn't agree on what came next. And this is the problem that the truce between the socialists, the liberals, and the nationalists was really only about changing the status quo. They all had very different ideas about what the new uh, form uh, would take. So, for instance, uh, liberals wanted to see um, essentially liberal constitutional monarchies. Nationalists wanted to see um, new countries formed out of uh, these old empires. And socialists, of course, wanted to see socialist revolutions and the public ownership of all private property and major reforms in terms of worker rights. Um, in France, we saw the first breaking down of this um, uh, essential uh, truce with the June Days uprisings. The uh, Second Republic, the government of France, um, rumors circulated that they were planning on shutting down those national workshops, which were places where uh, workers could go and get work, and they were very popular. Um, and at the same time, France actually elected um, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte III, who, yes, indeed, he was Napoleon's nephew, believe it or not, the Napoleon's nephew, and he's elected president of France. And you would think that France would have had enough of Napoleon's, because very shortly after Napoleon came to power, he, of course, um, seized complete control over France in a coup. You'd think they would have learned their lesson with the first Napoleon. Anyway, they didn't. Um, in, in Austria and in Prussia, the authorities essentially reasserted control, and the rebels were uh, sent to prison, and in Germany and Italy, these were places where nationalists had been desperately trying to create brand new countries and unite German-speaking lands and Italian-speaking lands, and they had failed to be able to do that. And this was particularly true in the German-speaking lands. So the nationalists looked to who would be the natural sort of... Um, uh, king or um, uh, a leader of a united new German country. And the most obvious choice would have been the king of Prussia. He was considered a fairly progressive uh, king at the time, and Prussia was the largest of, of those little German-speaking countries. So it would make sense for Prussia to take a leading role. But um, uh, Frederick William, um, the Frederick William IV, uh, famously said, I will not accept a crown from the gutter. Um, and he rebuked the, um, uh, the pleas from the nationalist revolutionaries to actually uh, become a king of a new united Germany. So the dream of uniting Germany and Italy would have to wait a while longer. So although the revolutions of 1848 were in the short term a failure, the ideas that were at the heart of it definitely did not go away. And we will continue next week seeing the ripple effect coming out of the French Revolution, which will be the final triumph of nationalism in Europe with the unification of Italy and Germany two brand new countries that did not exist before. These two countries would completely upend the balance of power in Europe. And with that, we would uh, ultimately rumble towards uh, the world wars of the 20th century. So it's a um, pretty big development that we'll be talking about in our next podcast. So uh, I'll, I'll see you then.